This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight's subject is not for the squeamish. Um, it's really a major topic. It's um, a topic related to the parsha, a very contemporary topic, and it's something that every Jew needs to know about. Um, at first, it would sound like, you know, how relevant is this? Uh, everybody, uh, we still come from traditional homes, and how you doing? And uh, everybody knows that the final rites are, are always performed kehalacha. But there are many, many details that are important to uh, be aware of when it comes to the uh, the end of life issues. Um, so we're going to start a two segment topic. We're going to talk about embalming, autopsies, and cremation in halacha. Actually, this Shabbos. It has been dedicated uh, by shuls across America as Team Shabbos. I'm not exactly sure what it stands for. It's something to do with end of life issue awareness. You know, how the T E A M, you know, I and Shun. But um, so we're already starting this Wednesday night. We're speaking about uh, these three topics embalming, autopsies, and cremation. And these are all very relevant topics and the topics that everybody needs to be aware of. Uh, let's begin with the following. In this week's parsha, so in Kapasme Chumash, we find that Yaakov Avinu passes away, and upon the demise of Yaakov Avinu, <coughs> Yosef Hatzadeh commands the doctors to embalm Yaakov Avinu. So, if you look in Parak Nun of this week's parsha, Parshas Vayechi, um, we find upon the demise of Yaakov Avinu, Yosef tries to care for uh, Yaakov's final rites. Vayipo Yosef al pnei aviv. Yosef falls on his father's face. Vayev galav, he cries. Vayishakala, he kisses him. Vayitzav Yosef es avodav es haroifim. Yosef commands his servants, the doctors, lachenoid es aviv, to embalm his father. Vayachan to haroifim, and the doctors embalm es Yisrael Yaakov Avinu. And that's the question we want to talk about. Is it permitted for a Jew to be embalmed? So you say, I mean, come on, this is not, you know, Egypt, we don't have pyramids. Uh, who, who mummifies themselves with Zana Zah? Well, you should know, in the secular world, almost everybody, to some extent, has some procedure of chanita done to them before they're buried. Um, in almost uh, every funeral home across America, they have visiting hour, they have a visit, and uh, in preparation for the family's visit, they put a, a lot of chemicals, they inject the mace with many chemicals to give him a good look. Most of the time people look much better after they're dead than we're alive. Not most people. Everybody. In the secular world, in the outside world, they make up, they perfume, they smell better, they look better, and they can't even talk. So they're better off in every way. Sometimes they even position their mouth with a certain look, and they put a, a pipe in their hand to, that they should die with their favorite pipe and uh, favorite book. So the question is, is that permitted? Is a Jew allowed to be embalmed, chemically treated, um, preserved in any way? So let's talk a little bit about Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, um, now l- l- let's discuss the following. What could possibly be the issue with um, embalming somebody? And we'll see there are two possible procedures, depending on what they do with the internal organs. Is this considered mm-hmm. nivel hames? Is it disgracing the body? Are you allowed to be menavel mace? Where does it say in the Torah you can't be menavel mace? Is it a bizayon for the mace? Does it cause tzar to the mace? Does a dead person feel anything? The Gemara says in the Sech de Brachos that a worm cutting through a dead body is like a knife in uh, raw flesh. Is that literal? Is that allegorical? Does it hurt the mess when you cut up the mess? So these are all um, things that we have to examine, and it starts with this week's parasha because, of course, there were two people who passed away in this week's parsha, and uh, they were both embalmed. They were both nechnat, and that is Yaakov Avinu. And then finally, at the end of the parsha, the last passage in this week's parsha is Vayomas Yosef ben Meav Esar Shanim. Yosef dies at 110. Vayachan tu Oisoy, and they embalmed him. Vayisam ba'aron b'masarim, they put him in a box. So Yaakov was embalmed, and Yosef was embalmed. Okay, so let's start with Rabbeinu Machaye. Vayachan tu Haroitim. What's the procedure? So uh, here, here's the plan of action, by the way. Tonight I want to talk about chanita and bombing, and autopsies <coughs> a little bit, and cremation a little bit, and then the second segment 
We're going to talk about autopsies more in depth and cremation more in depth. Okay, so what is the process? Says Rabbeinu Bechaye, who is a Rishon, Vayachantu haroifim, Inyan hachanata haya, the concept of chanata, shahayu merkachim oisoi bebesamim. They would mix various spices, vizanim, zanimar, minim harbe of spices, keinyan shakasa vaasa hamelech, like it says by King Asa, vayashki veyu bemishkav, they lay him in the bed, asher mole besamim, full of perfume, vizanim and spices, merkachim, blended, kemerkachas maasa. What's kemerkachas maasa? An apothecary's art. No, that's not a word that you hear too often, but that's the correct terminology to describe the art of blending various spices and perfumes, an apothecary. This is after they washed him. Now, look carefully, Rabbeinu Bechaye. Rabbeinu Bechaye is uh, clearly saying they didn't go into Yaakov Inu's body. They didn't remove his internals. It's just merely smearing him with various shmirzuchs and various creams and various uh, moisturizers and preservatives and uh, to keep his body fresh. Ay, says Rabbein Machaye. Uma she'omar vayichantu, that which it says they embalmed him, it doesn't mean that. Shetzivu lasas came. They commanded to do so. Ki hayu bekim b'chachmasateva. That was the recommendation. In other words, what's a doctor? The Iker doctors need to treat you. He, he gives you diagnosis. So yeah. back then also, the, why do you pay a doctor the big bucks? You know, he tells you what to do. Also, when it says vayachantu, it doesn't mean they embalmed him. They said he should be embalmed. But but they didn't actually touch his body. So Rabbeinu Bechai's definition of chanata is merely to smear the body with various perfumes and spices and fragrant aromas. And according to that, the shir does not begin because nothing really happened to Yaakov Avinu. They just freshened him up. They didn't touch his body. They didn't cut him up. They didn't remove any blood. They didn't remove any internal organs. And according to Rabbi Bechai, there's nothing really we could glean from what was done to Yaakov Avinu. How about the Zayar HaKadosh? Okay, fasten your seatbelts. We're going to read the words of the Zayar. Okay, the Zayar in this week's parasha. Amar Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba said, now this is very important, Lima. Many people think that Rav Shemar Yechai wrote the Zayar. He did not. Rabbi Abba wrote the Zayar. Shemar Yechai dictated the Zayar to Rabbi Abba. But much of the Zayar are the words of Rabbi Abba and the words of later Tanoim. Okay. So the Zohar says like this, Amar Rabbi Abba, Chanito di Yaakov mai iu. What happened with the embalming of Yaakov Avinu? So he said, I'm really zil shola asya. He said, uh, you know, what do you, what do you want from my life? Go ask a doctor. I don't know. That's not my specialty. <laughs> you have a kash and baba kama, bam natsiya, chas naiser, chas nida, no problem. Now you want to know how they embalmed Yaakov Avinu? Go to the Brooklyn Museum. Go to the Egyptology section and, and find out. Tachazi, come and see. It says, Ksiv, by Yitzav, Yosef es avod of asorei from lachnei es aviv. Yosef commanded the doctors to embalm his father. And by Yachan to haroi from es Yisrael. And they embalmed Yaakov. Salke daitoch, I would think, kishar b'nei nosha hava chanito da. I would think Yaakov Inu was embalmed like everybody else. Ah, so the first thing we're seeing is there are two kinds of embalming. The embalming that happened to Yaakov and the embalming that happened to everybody else. Now why was Yaakov embalmed, says Isaiah. It's, if it's because they had to travel a long distance with Yaakov Avinu, and that's an important halacha that we're going to see. I don't think they do it anymore, but in the olden days, when somebody needed to be buried in Eretz Yisrael and they took him on Elal, they didn't uh, put them in the freezer. Right? Well, I don't mean in Lakewood. I mean, they didn't actually put them in a cold room. Right? They would actually chemically inject the person with various chemicals to preserve them on the flight. Sometimes it could take a, do- a day or two. So why did they embalm Yaakov? If it's because of the length of the travel. But we know they embalmed Yosef, and Yosef was buried right there in the Nile. They put him in a box, and they, they put him uh, right there. So it says the Zayar, you can't say they embalmed Yaakov because of the distance of the travel. Look in the next ice. Ella Orcha de Malkan Inon. They embalmed Yaakov. That is common protocol for a king. Begin the Kayama Gufayo to preserve his body. What did they do? Chanti Loin Bimashach Rabbis. They smeared him with many creams. Allah Al Kalmishkan. They put on him all kinds of oils. Mu'ur of Bibusman, mixed with spices. Vishoiv Le Begufa. And it got absorbed in his body. So far, no cutting, no extracting, no removal of blood. Yoima basar yoima, day after day, with good oils, 40 days. 
And Basar der Stalem da, after this, Kaima Gufa Shlim Zimnan Sagin, his body would last a long time. Do you know why they embalmed him? Very interesting. Historical point of reference. Because in the Middle East, especially in Israel and Egypt, people decompose faster than anywhere else in the world. In Egypt and in Israel are the two fastest uh, rates of decomposition anywhere in the world. Little known fact. You put, you know, some, two people on the ground. You could do an experiment. Two, put two people on the ground. In America and in Israel, in Israel or in Egypt, they decompose much quicker. And therefore, that is the reason why in Egypt you have all these mummies. You know, in, in Egypt, everybody was mummified. The, the husbands, the wife, the children, the, the pets, the cats. You could go to the Brooklyn Museum, you could see Pharaoh, you could see Ramses, and you could see his pet cat. Still there, looking just as good as ever. You know, if you would unrind all the tissue, you know, the, the cat would come out just as good as ever. Why? Why do they do that? So the Zoya says, because mechala gufa umerakiv le lizman ze'er mikol shar ara. Things decompose much quicker there. And in order to preserve the body, they did this chanita on the inside and on the outside. Now, how'd they get the perfume on the inside of the body? Now, this is where it gets quite interesting. On the outside is very easy. They smear the skin. How are you going to get perfume and spices on the inside of the body? Says the Zayar. Migoy on the inside, the shavenahu mishcha al tabura. They would put spices on the navel. And it would then go into the navel, into the navel, the and it got absorbed into the intestines. And it preserved the body, the body from the inside on the outside. So one thing we have to explain is what in the world is he talking about? If you could put things on a navel, it ain't going inside the body. But interestingly, there's a tshuva in the Chassam Soifer that explains the Zayar, and the Chassam Soifer says also a very interesting scientific phenomenon. You know, you'll have to see if that is what modern science believes in. And that is the Gemara says in Masech Danida that a person in the fetal position, their mouth is sealed shut, and their navel is wide open. The nutrients go in through the navel, and the mouth is sealed shut. As soon as a person is born, everybody knows the mouth opens up, by some people a little bit too much, and the navel seals shut. As soon as a person dies, a person reverts back to the fatal state. The mouth seals shut, and the navel opens up. That's the meaning of the Zohar, the Psalm Sefer says, that they were able to put and inject the spices into the navel, because once a person passes away, they revert back to being like a, an embryo. Interesting, according to Ravina Bachaye and according to the Zayar, they didn't cut Yaakov, they didn't extract any blood, they didn't take out any of the internal organs. So we have nothing really to talk about. We have no precedent that embalming is permitted. However, there's an Abarbanel over here. And the Abarbanel learns, Pshutoi Kimashmoi, that they embalmed Yaakov of Vino. Now, what does that mean? So he gives us a very descriptive account of what embalming entails. So if you look in the Abarbanel number three, the Amar, Vayitzav Yosef is Avadav Aroifim. Yosef commanded his doctors, Shahoyu Avadav, they were his servants, Lefi Shahoya Noyeg Betachsise Hamalachim. They had the custom, it was protocol among the kings. Ad Shahoyu Loy Roifim, the Malacha Sachanata, they had doctors in the art of embalming. They imchantu as he saw they embalmed Yaakov, and what is embalming? The Hachanata he hoitsoas Hamoyach. First, they remove the brains. The halev, then they take out the heart. The hakaved, then they take out the liver. The chen hamayayim, they extract the intestines. The hamerirus, mitachagov, and all the bile and all the gall, all the bitter chemicals they extract from the body. The yimshechu hagov, mi bayis, mi chutz, b'shem ha'avaz, they smear the body inside and the outside with perfumes, and they fill up the body with minim besamim. And these besamim basically dry out the body. Very interesting. They need to fill up the body every single day with spices and then drain the spices daily. So this is a big art. You know, in the, in the olden days, it was a hush of a thing. You know, the highest ranking people were, I don't know what the, what, what are you called if you're an embalmer? I'm not sure what the name of the profession is. An embalmer. A mummifier. 
A machanet. Okay, whatever. Whatever it is. And the tzarich b'chol yom lahachlef ha'besomim, and he had to change the spices daily. Ah, the nira hamez kilu yoshen. The body looked like it was sleeping. V'lo yisapish, and it would not decompose. V'lo yisrach, it wouldn't smell. V'lo yisrach gumi mena b'nei adam, and people would not distance themselves from this person. Very interesting, you know, there's nothing more overwhelming than the, than the odor of a dead body. But this preserved the body. However, says the Abarbanel, it's not foolproof. If you know about embalming, very interesting, says Abarbanel, ultimately, because of all the chemicals, the skin and the flesh melt away little by little by little. What's the raya? Vayikach Moshe es. What do you mean, I thought he's a mummy. The answer is, a mummy preserves uh, for a little bit of time, but it's not foolproof. Ultimately, the skin and the flesh melts away, and that's why you're left with Atzmo Yosef, says the Abarbanel. So according to the Abarbanel, Yaakov Avinu was mummified and bombed in the full sense. Well, that might mean something halakhically. That might be a precedent. In other words, maybe we could learn from here that it's mutter to embalm somebody. If Yaakov Avinu was embalmed, then Yosef HaTzadik was the one who instructed Yaakov to be embalmed, maybe this is a precedent. Let's see a little bit further. If you look in Sefer Shmuel, um, the Navi tells us about the death of Shol HaMelech. So if you look at number four, the Pesukim tell us about the death of Shol, Vayakumu Kol Eshchayel. All the warriors got up, Vayelchu Kol Alayla, and they went the whole night, they took Shaul's body, and the bodies of his children, they came to Yavesh, and they burned them there. Wow, that's a, that's a Pandora's box. They burnt them? Who did they burn? They burned Shaul's body? So now what? That's a precedent for cremation. That's the simple meaning of the Pasuk. So you have to look at the Targum. The Targum Yonisam and Uziel says, The Kamu Kol Gevar Gibar, all the warriors got up, the Azalu Kol Elio, they went the whole night, and they took his body, uh, the body of Shaul, and the body of his children, Ukiloi Alehoi, and they burnt on them, Kimo De Kola, like you burn, Al Malchaya, on the kings. So the Targum doesn't say they burnt the bodies, they burnt on the bodies. So what does that mean? So there's a Radak here. The Radak says a few explanations. Each one is a Pandora's box. First, he quotes the Targum. That the Targum says, when it says they burnt the bodies of Shaul and his children, it, um, what does that mean? Says the Radak. F sure it could be, Shahaya daitoi kamoi shakasu rabbi seinu. That all that means is what Chazal tell us, that when a king would die, so what's going to happen with his throne, and what's going to happen with his horse, and what's going to happen with his clothing? What, an, uh, an ordinary person is going to wear it? Hayitachein. So the Minigwas, whenever a king died, they burnt down everything he owned. Why? It's a sign of respect. It's a way, basically, of saying that nobody is roy to partake of any possessions of the king. So the Targum doesn't mean they burnt Shoal's body. The Targum means they burnt Shoal's possession near his body. Right? Ziolov Mate Menashe. It doesn't mean on Mate Menashe. It means near his body. That's the first shot of the Radan. But then the Radak says, the Tachin Lafaresh, no. They actually burned the body of Shaul. Why? Because it's, it, it took some time until the, they were able to bury him. And his body and the body of the children became infested with worms. And it was not covered to have the king in such a state. And in order to preserve the dignity of the king, they cremated Shaul's body. Only the Basa. What, what else is there? Um, yeah, they burnt the basar. I mean, that means... Isn't cremation also the bones? Yeah, well, the truth is there's a lot of... Uh, I don't know, maybe you know better than me. There's a lot of controversy about cremation today. Because supposedly they, they offer the family a, a bottle of ashes that they say are the bones of the cremated. But there's no way in a short amount of time the bones burn. So they say it's the ashes of like 10 guys before. But uh, yeah, so cremation supposedly does not really burn the, the bones. When it says they burned, they burned his flesh because, you know, you can't really burn bones, but the bones were inside when, when he was burning it. But that's according to this, 
there's precedent that sometimes Sreifa Sagov might be mutter. Okay, and that's what we'll talk about yeah. the next year. But bottom line is, what happened to Shaul? Either they burnt his possessions, or they burnt his body. But there's a Toysus Yomtif in the Sechet of Sachem, and the Toysus Yomtif disagrees with the Radat. And the Toysus Yomtif says that when the Navi says they burnt the body of Shaul, you know what it means, they burnt the body of Shaul? They embalmed him. <coughs> and like the Barbanel says, what happens to the skin and the flesh of someone who they embalm? Ultimately, ultimately it melts. That's why Yosef ended up being Atzmois Yosef. That chemical process could be correctly termed burning. That's all the Navi means. When the Navi says, by Yisrafu Oysam Sham, the Navi is referring to the process of embalming. The, uh, the Tosis Yomtev says on the fifth line, Veli Nera, Shehasreifa Musav Alagviyos. The burning refers to the bodies. Lefi Shev Bismei Hachanata, because the spices of embalming, Sarfim Oysam, consume the flesh. I, are you allowed to embalm somebody, says the Tosis Yomtev? Of course you are. And it's a mitzvah to embalm someone. Why? Look in the last two lines. Abu Bisrefas Hachanata to to burn someone through embalming. Sheyeshba Toyeles Godal. There's a great benefit for the mace. Shalo Yisapesh, so he doesn't rot. Vishalo Yasriach, and he doesn't waste away. Verima Loitishot Boy. Can you imagine? There are a lot of the, there are great benefits of being embalmed. There are many good aspects of being a mummy. First of all, you don't rot and you don't smell, and there are no worms and nobody distances themselves from you. Four great milas. You know, if you were running a commercial or becoming a mummy, these would be the top four advantages of, you know, becoming a mummy. And therefore, the Tazi says, it goes without saying you could be embalmed, which is a chidosh nifla. So halacha lamaisa, what do we have so far? Rabbeinu B'chaye learns that Yaakov Inu was not really embalmed. He was just smeared with oils. According to the Zaya, they did not cut up Yaakov Avinu. But the Abarbanel learns that Yaakov Avinu was mummified like Pharaoh, like Ramses, and like all the things you see in the Brooklyn Museum. According to Toysus Yomtev, that is mutter l'chachila. Not only is it mutter, it's a toyelas gadol. Now, one thing is, the Abarbanel was uh, a great man, and I'm uh, a very... Um, consider myself very much connected to Abarbanel, but we don't paskin usually like Abarbanel. He's a parish on Tanakh. The Tosus Yomtif is a parish on Mishnayis, also not one of the, the Piske, Piske, uh, Piske Halacha. So let's see the Rajba. A dramatic Rajba. The Rajba in Shubhas Rajba Chilak Aleph, Simen Shin Samach Tes. Simen Shin Samach Tes. Listen to the following Shaila. Look at number eight. Ruvain Siva Bashas Tirasa Shiyisu Isa Likbar Isa Makam Kurasa Vaisa. Ruvain was about to die, and Ruvain says, I don't want you mar- uh, ba- burying me here. I want to go to Chvais, to Israel, to be buried with my forefathers. The problem is, on the day that he died, there was an oinus. There was a big snowstorm, and he, they couldn't get a flight that day. The next available flight was, let's say, in three days from now. And uh, they, they buried him temporarily. They were going to keep him laying around. For three days, they buried him temporarily in the backyard. And now the, they get a flight, and they want to bury him and, and exhume his body. Here's the problem. The body already started decomposing. There are they're, they're worms. The flesh already began to rot. So now the question is, they're allowed to move him because that was his wish, right? It's mitzvah l'kaim divrei hames. The question is, are they allowed to pour on his body sid? Sid is lime, which is a very powerful agent that would speed up the decomposition process so that basically the, the flesh would decompose very quickly so they can move him as soon as possible. So what's the problem? Says the Rajba, is it a bizayon to the mace to, to speed up his decomposition? Is it painful for the mace? Does a mace feel something? Doesn't the Gemara and Brachis say that a worm biting a mace is worse than a needle? So how do we view this? Says the Rajba, Mamashadavar Nifla, Kol ki hai sha'oisin la akel basaroi mehera. Whatever you could do to speed up the decomposition, to move him to where he wants, mutter. She'in kan misham bizayon, it's not a disgrace. Be'in kan misham tsar, it's not painful. 
Why? Shein basar meis margis vizama koshkein basid. Says the Raja, once you're dead, you don't feel anything. You don't feel flesh. You don't feel a knife. You don't feel sit. I remember in the old shul, the, you know, Rakhisham here we have uh, happy occasions. Over there I had officiates, you know, sometimes at uh, Leviah. So one time I was driving a few Alta Yudinas to uh, the cemetery, and they were talking in the back seat, and one of them, they were, they were basically discussing where is, where is the best place to be buried. And, you know, they were, you know, when people get older, they like to talk about medications, but they were even beyond that. Now they were, you know, discussing the next uh, topic. And one of them said, you know, this cemetery, it's so noisy. There's a highway right over it, and it just... And the other one said, Rose, don't you know when you're six feet on, under, you don't hear the trucks anymore. But the, the Rajva says that, you know, once a person is dead, it's my Sashaya. Once the, uh, once the person is dead, there's no tsar. It's not bizayon. Viharayo says the Rajva, because you could be mummified. And when you're mummified, they cut you open and they remove your innards and your, all your organs. And that's not sar and that's not bizayon. So the Rajva Paskins, could a person be embalmed? Mutter. Sack of the Rajva. Do we Paskin that way? No. We Paskin exactly like the Rajva except for the last line. So the Ramah in Yaradeya basically takes word for word the Rajma, but stops short of allowing embalming. In other words, we'll allow somebody who had to be buried temporarily in one location, we'll allow the family to pour lime all over the body to speed up the decomposition. But to go so far as to open somebody up and remove their innards, we don't do that. Says the Ramah, Ein malichin meis na'ir, kvuras le'ir acheres. We don't exhume a body. Unless it's from um, the diaspora to Eretz Yisrael. Or you want to take him to Kever Avais. Or if he commanded that you bring him to another place. Or if he wants to be buried, not in the house, but in the cemetery. Says You could put lime on him. To speed up the decomposition. But the, and who does the Rama quote? The Rama quotes the Rajba. But he leaves out the last line of the Rajba, the Haraya, that you could even cut somebody open and be and embalm them. So Allah Maisa, we do not perform Khanita. Is it Asr? We have not yet seen anybody who says embalming is Asr. Okay, so let me tell you um, what seems to be the bottom line. And in general, when it comes to end-of-life issues and Hilchas the, uh, the authoritative safer on it is the Gesher Achayim of Rabbi Chil Michal Tukachinsky. He wrote, Gesher Achayim is uh, pretty unanimously accepted, well, let's say when it comes to Hilchas Avelos. Avelos is less halach and more minhag, but Rabbi Chil Michal Tukachinsky's safer is like the, uh, the handbook of end-of-life issues. And he writes... Is it permitted to embalm a Jewish person? It's a big discussion. What are the problems? Well, I'm sort of holding off on one of them, but the problems are, number one, in many embalmings they extract, they, uh, they use a machine to suck out almost all the blood. What, what do you do with the blood? Do you have to bury that blood? What's the halacha if blood comes out of a person after they die? Does it have to be buried? No. Once a person is dead, you don't have to bury the blood. But that's only if the blood came out naturally. But if the blood was removed through a machine, then it should be buried. So what's going to be done with that blood? And number two, if you embalm someone and you preserve their body, they decompose slower. Excuse me, you delay the decomposition. And the decomposition of the body is a very important thing for a person's kapara. The Gemara says that Misa is not the only kapara. It's the decomposition is part of the kapara. So if you delay that, we're going to see the, the person's kapara is being uh, delayed, and that's not proper. So the Halach Lamaisa, the Rabbi Chil Michal Tukhachinsky says, the minog is that if you need to move a mace, and it's going to take a day or two to bury them, you are allowed to do certain things. You could put creams on them. You could put chemicals on them. You could put it into their body. You could put it on their body. Um, and that would be permitted under the circumstances. But not, do not take out the blood. However, if it's a long trip, 
and many days. So he says, let's say from uh, Israel, from America to Israel. Now he was talking back in the day when that when that was a very long trip. Then he said it's permitted even to use a machine to extract the blood to preserve the body. Now, I don't think they do that anymore. They just put it in the freezer, and uh, it works better. But um, and then that blood, he says, should be should be buried. So basically, what I've been holding off on is the uh, the position of the maritzchias, and even if it doesn't apply to embalming, it's something that certainly implies to autopsies. And you, nowadays, it's very important for a person to be aware, in the hospitals, they're very quick to try to perform an autopsy, and, and the family has to do whatever they can to uh, try to stop that. Now, what's wrong with an autopsy? So the Maritz Chia says that he has the following question. We know Yaakov Avina was embalmed, and according to Avar Benel, we're talking about the real deal. We're not talking about they just put cream on him, they extracted his inner, internal organs. So why don't we learn from there, not only is it mutter, learn from Yaakov Avinu that when a Jewish person dies, he should be embalmed. I mean, what better source do we have than Avinu Yaakov? What we should learn from Yaakov Avinu that the correct procedure is when a person dies, we embalm them. And says the Maratzchias, no, you're not allowed to. Embalming somebody and cutting them up is what's called nivel hames. And we'll see what the makar of that is. Aye, but what happened to Yaakov Avinu? Very important. Yaakov Avinu was before the Torah was given. And before the Torah was given, nobody had to keep the Torah. The same way nobody would ever ask, you know, we should learn from Yaakov Avinu, we should marry two sisters. Every Jew should marry two sisters. <coughs> it would solve the Shilich crisis, you know. Forget get it, guys getting married at 21. Right now, every newspaper, are you ready? He's ready, I'm ready. The Mashkiach said he's ready. Forget it. Everyone just marry two sisters. You're not... You know, you know how many more Shaduchim would take place if people would just marry two sisters like Yaakov Avinu? Terence says, yeah, but there's one problem. The Pasuk says, you know, you're not allowed to. So once the Torah was given, the halacha changes. Same thing with mummifying, same thing with embalming. Yes, Yaakov Avinu was embalmed. That was before the Torah was given. Now that the Torah is given, you can't do it. Why can't you do it? It's Nivol Hames. Okay, Rabbi said this is the key Gemara for tonight's year. So Gemara Masach Techulen, Dafir Alpha Mabe is one of the really fundamental Gemaras in Shas. Everybody knows there's a halacha in Shas, it's a klal and Torah, Hulch and Acha Harun. You follow the right. And the Gemara wants to know there's a major sukya in Chulen. What is the makar that you follow a right? How do you know you follow a right? You know, why don't you need 100% verification? Why do we follow 90%? Why do we follow a right? So the Gemara says, the Makar. You know how we know we follow a right? Two of them go over to a guy, Reuven. And the two of them say, Reuven, if you kill Shimon, we're going to kill you. We're going to chop off your head. And Reuven kills Shimon. So what do we do with Reuven? We kill the kill and we give him chenek. Oh, wait, wait a second. Why do we kill Reuven? Maybe Shimon was a trefa. Maybe Shimon had a mortal wound. And the halacha is, if you kill someone who's going to die anyway within 12 months, you're not chayav misa. So why do we kill Reuven if he kills Shimon? Maybe Shimon was a treifa. Must be, we follow a roiv. Most people are not a treifa. And you could assume that the person who was murdered is a healthy person. Correct? The Gemara, what are you talking about? You're just going to assume that Shimon was healthy to kill Reuven? Why don't you do an autopsy on Shimon? Cut open his body, check out his internals, see if he has any uh, fetal wounds, and if he's a trefa, then you'll save Reuven's skin. Do an autopsy. <coughs> Says the Gemara, you can't do an autopsy on somebody, it's Nivel Hames. What is Nivel Hames? You're di- disgracing the body, you're making the body disgusting. To cut up a, a body, even though it's dead, it's a uh, lack of respect, it's a lack of, of human dignity, you're disgracing. The dead, it's Nivol Hames. So there, here we have a, a black and white Gemara that says that you're not allowed to cut up a body, even though the body's dead. The Gemara then asks, well, wait a second, but think of the alternative. So it's better that Ruvain should die than not to do an autopsy on Shemayn? And then the Gemara ultimately answers, it's not even going to help to do an autopsy on Shemayn. Why? Because maybe in the place that Ruvain, let's say Ruvain shot Shemayn, Maybe in the path of the bullet hole, there was a mortal wound, and now you won't be able to see. 
because the bullet went right through it. So it doesn't even help to do an autopsy. But bottom line is the Gemara says you're not allowed to do an autopsy. So says the Maritzchias, this is the Makar that halacha lamaisa, one is not allowed to have a, is not allowed to be embalmed. So this, you know, for a, a matter of interest, there was an article that I think, I believe it appeared in the New York Times uh, many years ago, and then it became somewhat of a, uh, a little, um, a famous piece of literature. It's an article by a woman by the name of Jessica Mitford called Behind the For- Formaldehyde Curtain. Behind the formaldehyde curtain. You know, formaldehyde is what they used to use in the uh, non-iron shirts, you know, to keep it, to keep it, uh, to keep it firm. Well, it's also a very bad chemical, and um, this is considered a very uh, outrageous piece of literature. And I want to share it with you, because you know there's halachic debate whether embalming is nivel hames. So let me just give you a little taste what they actually do today in America. Um, I don't know, it's only like 20 years ago. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I'm not sure if it's been uh, updated. She was, she, it, it, here's, the, here, here's the way it goes. You'll need a stable stomach, she says. Alas, poor Yorick. Who knows what that is? Shakespeare. Yeah, very good. Shakespeare, okay. How surprised you would be to see how his counterpart of today is whisked off to a funeral parlor and in short order is sprayed, painted, rouged, Sliced, pierced, pickled, waxed, trimmed, creamed, and neatly dressed, transformed from a common corpse into a beautiful memory picture. This process is known in the trade as embalming and restorative art, and is so universally employed in the United States and Canada that the funeral director does it routinely without consulting corpse or kin. He regards as eccentric those few who are hardly enough to suggest that it might be the splendid one. Okay. So if you want to get a little picture of what, what is done... Okay, let's talk about Mr. Jones. To return to Mr. Jones, the blood is drained out through the veins and replaced by embalming fluid pumped in through the arteries. As noted in the, in the principles and practice of embalming, every operator has a favorite injection and drainage point, a fact which becomes a handicap only if he fails or refuses to forsake his favorite when conditions demand it. So here are some favorite drainage points. The carotid artery, the femoral artery, jugular vein, subclavin vein, Subclavian vein. There are various sorts of embalming fluids. There's flextone, and flextone produces a mild, fled, uh, flexible rigidity. Okay, now listen to this. About three to six gallons of a dyed and perfumed solution of formaldehyde, glycerin, borax, phenol, alcohol, and water is soon culating through Mr. Jones, whose mouth has been sewn together with a needle directed upward between the upper lip and the gum and brought out through the left nostril. With the corners raised slightly, so they basically they pick up the corners of the mouth to give Mr. Jones a pleasant expression. For a more pleasant expression. But what if Mr. Jones is buck-toothed? Have no fear. His teeth are cleaned with banami and coated with colorless nail polish. His eyes, meanwhile, are closed with flesh-tinted eye caps and I cement. Mr. Jones looks better than his high school pictures. Okay. <laughs> so, um, is that Nivel Hames? Is what they do today Nivel Hames? Ein l'cha Nivel G'day L'mizu. There's nothing more disgusting. Even if back in the day, in the times of, you know, Joseph in uh, Egypt, they did it in a, in a uh, dignified way, the way they do it today is... You know, they have, it, and it depends how the person dies. They actually are able to use cause of death to the advantage of making the person look good. So, for example, if somebody chas some dies of carbon monoxide poisoning, they're able to use that to give their skin color a fresher appearance. So the whole thing is, uh, is a dover menuval admoid, and halach uh, ha we do not use it today. Uh, but that's the concept. The concept is nivel hames. Let me share with you, um, before we start the, the topic of autopsies, just the thought of the Chassam Soifer. Chassam Soifer says something uh, very interesting. Chassam Soifer, remember, was commenting on the, on the Zayar. According to the Zayar, what did they do to Yaakov Avinu? They stuck the spices into the navel, and as we said, once a person passes away, the navel opens up, and they're able to inject the spices. 
And uh, some of the achroinim, some sefer mentions the leket kemach, is bothered. Well, you know, how come uh, the only record of anybody ever being embalmed through their navel is Yaakov Avinu? Why didn't the pharaohs, why weren't they embalmed this way? And why don't we find that Yaakov Avinu turned into bones like Yosef HaTzadik? By Yosef it says, Ve'yikach Moshe Sa'atz Moshe Yosef. What about Moshe? Uh, what about, what about um, Yaakov? Was Yaakov bones? Or it sounds like Yaakov remained completely intact. Buried right away. What? Yaakov was buried right away. Yeah, but if he was embalmed and mummified, then he, sh- he should have also ultimately... In other words, it, was he, did he turn into bones? It was 70 days later. So the Chassam Soifer says, very interesting idea. If you look in the Ramban, at the end of Parshas um, Chaye Sara, the Ramban writes that by Yaakov, you know, it says the word Vayigva. And by Yosef, it does not say the word Vayigva. What's the difference between Vayigva and Vayamos? Vayigva means, according to the Ramban, where the internal organs melt away to the point where the Ramban says that by the time Yaakov Vino died, his internal organs had already disintegrated. They had melted. Says the Chassam Soifer, the method of embalming that they used for Yaakov Avinu would not work for anybody else. Because you could inject somebody with all the chemicals in the world. If they have a digestive system with the rotting food and, and all kinds of excrement on their intestines, the perfume and the spice are not going to preserve that. There's no way that the person could be preserved. It's only Yaakov Avinu who his internals had already melted out because it says Vayigva. So for, for someone like Yaakov Avinu, he was the only one who was ever eligible for this method of embalming where they were able to stick the uh, spices through the navel. But a Yosef HaTzadik or anybody else where it doesn't say Eloshna Vayigva and his system was running until his demise then this system of embalming was ineffective, and they had to do it by removing the... Uh, they had to, they had to in, in, in other words, they had to inject and remove the inner organs, and that's why it was only Yosef who turned into Atsama, Yismashenk, and Yaakov Avinu was completely preserved on the inside and the outside. Interesting. <coughs> Rabbi Yonis and Ibershitz wants to know, why is Egypt the country that specializes in mummification. There are many ancient civilizations, and so why, why specifically Mitzrayim? So we already saw in the Zayar that you know, Egypt was a tough land because the bodies decompose very quickly. But he doesn't take that approach. And he says that in Egypt, they, they were very... Um, they had strong belief in the afterlife. And they understood that as soon as the soul separates from the body, the soul goes off into other worlds, and it would be impossible to communicate then with that soul. Egypt's civilization was based on being Doya Shalamesim, speaking and communicating with the dead. And it's even our tradition that so long as the body is intact in the ground, the neshama somehow hovers over the body. It's only once the body decomposes that the neshama goes to its ultimate rest. In Mitzrayim, they believed very strongly that if you're able to preserve the guf, the soul will remain in that location, and, I, and then you can actually communicate with the soul. That's why in the Psukim that talk about not being Dore Shalamesim, not requesting of the dead, it says, don't do what the Mitzrim do to be Dore Shalamesim. It's because of their belief in the Aptah, that's why they mummified everybody. And Rabbi Yenison Ibershit says an astounding thing. The Gemara tells us in the Sechta Tainis, Yaakov Avinu Loimes. What does that mean? We know he died. And what about Avram Avinu? Avram Avinu Mace, Yitzchak Avinu Mace. In what way Yaakov Avinu Loimes? Yaakov Avinu Loimes, because Yaakov Avinu was mummified. And since he was mummified, his body never decomposed. And if his body never decomposed, his neshama always is hovering over his guf, ba'olam azeh. So of all the neshamos of the others, the one which is piled for us more than anybody else is Yaakov Avinu, because Yaakov Avinu's neshama is still here in Olam Hazeh. Because the Egyptians did a really good job in bombing Yaakov Avinu. Now, when it came to the pharaohs and the and Ramses, they were Rishayim. So it didn't do anyone good to have their neshama sticking around in this world. But to me, this is like a completely startling concept that the mummification of Yaakov Avinu somehow is for the benefit of Klai. First of all, it was effective. 
and it's to our benefit to keep Yaakov Avinu here in this world. Okay, let me just quickly bring you into the next topic, and we'll, we'll uh, proceed with it in Mitzvah Shem next time. This is a landmark tshuva, and really this was the focus of the shir, <coughs> to get to this tshuva, the night of Yehuda, in number 15, Madura Tanyana Simon Ratio. A question came in from London. What's the question? The question was from a, uh, uh, somebody by the name of Leif Fischels, and he was, uh, he was a rabbi in London, and somebody had a certain sickness. Evan Bekisai. He had a stone in his pocket. Anybody familiar with which illness that is? Gold kidney stones. Goldstones. Goldstones. Gold maybe kidney stones. What's the kiss? Kiss and Mara. Ah, so we have a doc over here. <laughs> the the uh, goldstones. The problem is, the doctor went in, and the doctor could not figure out what to do, and the guy died. It's not like today. It was 200 years ago, right? Yeah, it still happens, right? And the guy died. So now the Shaila was, the doctors wanted to do an autopsy to try to learn the area better, to be able to learn how to treat this, this type of disease, how to, how, where they could cut, where they can cut. They wanted to, for the sake of uh, the medical field, they wanted to make an autopsy on this patient. After all, even if you want to say that doing an autopsy is nivel hamis, but we know that all Yisurim and the Torah are suspended for the sake of Hatzalas Nefashas. And if learning about the, the goal, learning about that part of the body, will be able to save lives in the future, then can the doctor make an autopsy for the sake of improving his medical knowledge? And this is one of the most important shuvahs and shasa shuvahs, Naidu Bihuda where the Nadi Huda identifies the guidelines of what is considered Hatzalas Nefashis. <clears throat> and the Nadi Huda says, it is forbidden to make an autopsy on this patient, even if doing so could in the future save millions of lives. Why not? Says the Nadi Huda, the definition of Hatzalas Nefashis is not saving someone's life in the future. Even if you know for sure you're going to need this information, the definition of Atzalas Nefashis is clear and present danger. By the way, even in American law, there's a legal concept, clear and present danger. So therefore, since the halacha <coughs> dictates that you're not allowed to cut up a human body because it's considered nivel hames, even though you could glean medical information, which could then save human life. Now, the next time somebody has a goldstone, the doctors won't kill him. It doesn't matter. Right now, there's nobody whose life's in danger. For the sake of knowledge, to be able in the future to save lives, so you're saying, does that mean that I don't have a chiv to join Hatzalah because right now nobody's life is in danger? Exactly. There's no chiv to join Hatzalah. The chiv is if someone's life is in danger, you have to save them. But there's no obligation to learn how to say It might be a nice thing to do and a noble thing to do, but it's not demanded from the chiyuvim of Hatzal Fashish. So what about organ donation? Organ donation, I, I wasn't going to talk about tonight, is a very, um, in my opinion, the most misunderstood and misrepresented topic in all of halacha. They like, they want people to think that organ donation is halachic organ donation. You ever see that? Now, you could donate, a person could donate a kidney, it might be a great mitzvah to donate a kidney, because the person has two kidneys. However, most organs are no longer viable when a person is dead. They're not viable once a person dies. They are viable in the interim between brain death and cessation of respiratory activity and cardiac cessation. However, according to most skin, the person is alive during that time. And removing their organs is not only not a mitzvah, is murder is murder. Corneal is the exception. So a lot of organizations will find the poiskim who say you could donate the cornea and they'll say, oh, he's on the, he's on, he supports uh, organ donation. No, he supports corneal donation. But the heart and the lungs, there's no way to do so without killing somebody, halachically. And according to Rav Shomazam and Orbach, and according to Rav Yashiv, and most likely according to Rav Moshe, it's a serious, uh, it's a serious thing. But uh, we should definitely have a share on that.
um, it gets involved in the, what is considered the halachic moment of death and whether organ donation is, is permitted. But in any event, this is the psaac of the Nebuchadnezzar, which we'll discuss more next time, that the, the halachic realm of Atzalus Nefoshers is clear and present sakana. But for the sake of future saving of the life, one would not be allowed to violate even an Isser Durabonon for the sake of in the future saving human life. Rabbi Isai, thank you everyone for coming. Have a great evening. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.